Donc autant euh, la Hollande que la Wallonie et euh, la France également. Je crois qu'il y a aussi quelques personnes qui viennent de Hollande. Donc c'est un, un événement qui nous tient bien sûr fort à cœur. Alors, question pratique. Vous avez donc les casques qui sont à votre disposition dans le fond de la salle et vous avez deux canaux. Le canot 1. à 11h, donc la, la première partie va durer 90 minutes. Et donc, euh, voilà, euh, on vous présente aussi bien évidemment le docteur Vasquez, que vous avez déjà entendu à deux reprises, en tout cas en Valonie, et qui nous fait l'honneur de revenir une troisième fois pour ce séminaire sur l'immunité et les infections virales. Alors, vous savez que le contexte, évidemment, est tout à fait lié. On connaît une croissance importante des infections virales aujourd'hui, notamment euh, qui est un projet du virus Ebola. Et donc le docteur Vasquez a beaucoup, beaucoup travaillé sur le sujet, travaille encore beaucoup dessus. Il est l'auteur de, de nombreux livres, comme vous le savez. Et donc nous avons la chance de l'entendre aujourd'hui pour une journée scientifique entière. Euh, et voilà, je vais passer la parole à Bruno. Merci et très bon séminaire. Oui, bonjour. Et qui est-ce que vous avez reçu Nous sommes les Nederlands. Het is de eerste maal dat we, of ja, een van de eerste malen dat we eigenlijk zowel vanuit Frankrijk, Nederland en België eigenlijk mensen kunnen samenbrengen. Als spreker hebben we vandaag Alles Vaskes. Hij heeft uh, heel wat ervaring, heeft heel wat literatuur al gepubliceerd. Op Amazon.com kan je in feite enorm veel van zijn boeken terugvinden. En we spreken dan wel effectief over boeken tussen 700 en 900 bladzijden. Dus ik wil maar zeggen, als je uh, op plan bent om zoiets aan te komen, zal het zeker de moeite zijn. Vandaag zal hij het hebben over antivirale strategieën zitten met het Ebola-verhaal. Uh, dat is een onderdeel van het verhaal, maar het is, gaat altijd over de immuniteit in het algemeen. Uh, ook voor de vertaling moet ik zeggen dat het voor de Fransstaling uh, nummer 1 is dat ik dat dus uh, kon klikken. En voor de Nederlandse taal is het nummer 2. We hebben nog een kleine pauze vanaf 11 uur. En uh, dan kan je altijd uh, nog uh, voor zijn ervaringen uitwisselen met de collega's. Ik laat nu uh, de heer Vaskis aan het woord. You have the words. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, good morning, everyone. Thanks for making your way here uh, in this dreary January day. Uh, so obviously the topic today is to discuss uh, viral infections. And what I'd like to be able to do over the course of the day is help you look at virus infections in a different way. Uh, and we're going to approach that from a couple of different perspectives not only medically and nutritionally, but also uh, a little bit of commentary socially and politically as well. So we did make a, a slight change to the schedule. Instead of going for 60 minutes and then 90 minutes, we're going to go for 90 minutes and then 60 minutes. So my goal is to get through this first presentation, which is just context, and then get into at least the first half of the second uh, presentation, which will actually be the, the therapeutic component. So having said that, and since everything's being translated, I, I try to keep my words as, as few as possible to make it easier on everyone, especially during the, the translation. Uh, that's obviously today's event. And uh, appreciation to uh, Energetica and Biotics Research for helping me get here. Uh, everything I'm going to cover right now is in this new book that I just published uh, last year called Antiviral Strategies and Immune Nutrition. This is available as a paper book, but it's also available as a digital book. The advantage to the digital book, of course, is that it's easier to carry around because you can have it in your computer or your phone. Uh, and also I can update that on a regular basis, which is more complicated with the paper book. So, uh, what you're getting right now is the most current version of this material, and I, I plan to update it in about uh, two months. So if you have the digital version, you get the automatic update. Uh, main purpose of this presentation, as I already said, is to, is to look at uh, treating viral infections from a different perspective. So my own perspective, for example, uh, is pretty, pretty diverse but I'm gonna even go beyond the training that I had. So my training is, as most of you know, is chiropractic, naturopathic medicine, and osteopathic medicine, which in the United States is the same as medical physicians. 
Uh, one of the things I noticed over the years is that throughout all of those programs, at, at no time whatsoever did we actually learn a really good strategy for treating viral infections. Uh, and I'll review that, that educational structure in just a moment. One of the things I want to emphasize in this first section is what all virus infections have in common. Uh, what we learn in medical school is how to distinguish one viral infection from another and how to treat them differently. Uh, and I think that that's an excellent approach if the goal is to be an excellent diagnostician and to then use antiviral drugs. Uh, and I, that is mostly the goal of medical education, diagnosis and drugs. Uh, but for us to be more successful as clinicians, I think that we have an advantage if we look at viral infections uh, in terms of understanding the, the common themes and the common physiologic pathways that we can then uh, treat effectively with nutrition. So as I say here, and this is a new slide that I, I just made this morning, if we appreciate what all virus infections have in common, then we can see common vulnerabilities that we can actually address very effectively. If all we do is focus on the differences in viral infections, then I think we'll, we'll remain therapeutically and clinically lost. Uh, and so I want to see if we can get past that. Also, in my opinion, uh, everything exists within a social context, right? So even our understanding of viral infections has a social and political tone to it, we could say, right? So. And we've all been taught, and I'm saying that, again, from my own educational background, going to you know, three different doctor programs. We've all been taught to look at viral infections in a certain way. And the way that we've been taught to look at viral infections isn't without its political and social context. So I think we should appreciate some of that context, and we'll do that here. Uh, this is also a new slide, which I just made this morning. All it says, basically, is that uh, even though we're going to talk about viral infections, my main purpose in, in today's presentation is to talk about new ways to treat those, not necessarily to review all of the drugs and all the vaccines and all the virus infections. What I mostly want to focus on is how we can address these in different ways. And I think that's what I would hope you would expect as well. So we don't want to spend our time doing basic science that you can get off of any uh, website or textbook. Uh, what we want to focus on is what's new and innovative here. So in 2014, uh, I don't know to what extent uh, the European community and press was inundated uh, and overwhelmed with news on viral infections, but in the United States, uh, they were certainly getting a lot of information on, on viral infections to the point of actually trying to induce hysteria, it would seem. So for example, uh, this was a relatively uh, new virus infection that ended up killing uh, several young kids especially. This was in the news and people were kind of starting to have panic over the severity and uh, speed of these viral infections. Here's another uh, article talking about this viral infection that targets kids. And here's another article talking about, of course, Ebola. And I don't know how much press Ebola got here in, in Europe. At this, at this time of the year, last year in November, I was in South America, Colombia. But even then, the news everywhere I could see was just talking about Ebola and panic and, and more and more panic. And that's a really good example of mixing science with politics. Because as you'll see now, in, in just a moment, uh, that information was, was distorted uh, for some would argue political purposes. Uh, and obviously, we're talking about Ebola. Uh, one of the things I noticed throughout all of these conversations about viral infections is that the, the consensus in the news and among the politicians and public health engineers was just a, a consensus of panic. Like there was no coordinated understanding of viral infections. It was just panic, emergency, uh, military uh, involvement. 
And I was kind of uh, curious as to why that was. Uh, it seemed very inappropriate to me and very uncoordinated. So that was part of the reason why I revisited my own strategy here. So my own strategy has four components, which we'll look at here, and these, this will be the main focus of the day. The first part is an antiviral component. What can we do to actually destroy or target the virus itself? That's one of the main goals. That's also the goal of drug therapy. Second component is what I call anti-replication, or how can we block viral replication? Some drugs work at this level. Many nutrients work at this level. So you'll notice that the first two components are actually very consistent with the medical model. We're just going to use nutrients instead of drugs. The third component is what I call immunonutrition. I'll define that later, but it basically just means using nutrition to support the immune system so the immune system can do its job. Uh, that's not a novel concept in naturopathic medicine, but it's a relatively novel concept in medical training. And then cellular and systemic support. What can we do to actually support the entire body? What can we do to support uh, cellular function so that it's not impaired uh, and therefore doesn't have the, the opportunity through its impairment to contribute to viral disease? So four components. Uh, what I'd like to do before lunch is go through components, uh, hope at certainly one and two, and hopefully we'll get to enter into component number three as well. So that's the outline of the day. We're going to talk about antiviral, how to target the virus, number one, how to block replication, how to support the immune system, and then how to support the overall uh, cellular health as well as systemic health. As I mentioned before, I've been through three doctor programs, and in none of those programs did I actually see a cohesive strategy delivered to the students. And I think that that was a perfect strategy if our goal was to be confused and rely on drugs and vaccination. But that's not the goal that I have. So what we learn in medical school, we have classes in microbiology, the take home message from microbiology is that microbes cause disease and if you can clean the community or wash your hands enough, then you won't get sick. So the subliminal message in microbiology class is sanitation. In pathology, I think we learn a lot of diseases uh, caused by viruses, but we don't really learn how to treat those viral infections by themselves. Uh, I think that emphasizes our use of vaccinations. And then, of course, we have a class in pharmacology where we learn to use drugs. So at no point in time do we actually learn how to use nutrients to either block viruses or uh, mitigate the adverse effects of those infections. I think that's a huge shortcoming. So what we're going to do right now in this section, uh, I'm going to talk about patterns of viral illnesses, then I'm going to talk about vaccinations and drugs, and I'll try to get that, I'll try to get through that with some degree of speed. So here's, here are a few things that I think everyone needs to appreciate so that we can uh, realize the, the urgency of this information. Uh, and that is that all of you, all of us, we all have viral infections all the time, whether we know it or not. So, you know, one way of reframing our perspective on viral infections is to is to not look at them as episodic events, but to look at them as ongoing daily events. So even though I'm pretty healthy and pretty clean, I'm sure I've got some viral infections and I know that all of you do too. Uh, and when we talk about viral infections, one of the ways that we can categorize viruses is to look at viruses in two categories. One is what we call exogenous viruses, or viruses that come from outside. Those are things like influenza, herpes, hepatitis, virus, Ebola. Those are exogenous viruses. Those come from outside and infect the body. Another type of 
Another category of viral infection is what we call endogenous viruses. Those are viruses that you already have encoded in your DNA. You're born with these viruses. Again, those are called uh, endogenous retroviruses. Everybody has those as well. And I'll detail those more in just a moment. So, you know, again, my point in bringing up those two uh, items is to say that everyone has exogenous viruses and endogenous virus infections all the time. So, this is what I call the total viral load. Exogenous viruses, endogenous viruses, and another class of viruses called bacteriophages. Bacteriophages are viruses that only infect bacteria. And since you have trillions of bacteria in your gastrointestinal tract, a lot of those bacteria are infected by viruses, and then those virus, uh, that virus activity, we could say, has some effect on systemic inflammation and systemic health. For example, and this is the best example, we see an elevated uh, quantity of bacteriophages in patients who have inflammatory bowel disease, like uh, ulcerative colitis, but especially Crohn's disease. So I think that that data is, is relatively new. Uh, I'm not going to spend a lot of time on bacteriophages today, but I just want you to be aware that, that they exist, what they are, and the, the association with inflammatory bowel disease. So in this slide, what we're going to do is go through step by step the components of viral entry and viral replication. And this is more or less true for all viruses. It's mostly true. Uh, but the, the main point here is to begin to understand viruses in terms of basic physiology and basic components that we can then address with nutritional therapy. If we have a poor understanding of viral disease, then we're going to be more reliant, I think, on drugs and vaccinations. And that's, that's a choice. Uh, people can use drugs and vaccinations all they want. I'm not going to resist that. But I do want to show you in this presentation that we do have some options. So the way that viruses cause disease is they attach to the cell. Uh, different viruses have uh, different affinity for different cell types. We'll talk about that in just a moment. So this is an exogenous virus. It's a virus from the outside. It has to attach to the cell and then enter into the cell. Then it has to enter into the nucleus. And then it has to get incorporated into the nucleus and the replicative machinery. Eventually that leads to protein production and then that has to be assembled into a new virus and then the virus gets released. So that's the basic pattern of how viruses cause uh, their own replication. Viruses cannot replicate on their own, right? Bacteria can replicate on their own, but viruses cannot. Viruses can only replicate by embedding themselves within the cell and, and hijacking the machinery of the cell to cause its own replication. So that gives you a way to manage viral infections. One way to manage viral infections is to block this pathway, block this machinery, so that the virus can't produce itself by hijacking the, the cell. Here's another way of looking at the same uh, information. We'll, we'll look at the same uh, information in a different way here, and then I'll extend it just a bit. So here's a normal cell. Let's say that the virus attaches to the cell and then enters into the nucleus. The virus then has to integrate itself into the DNA or the replicative machinery of the human cell, right? So again, if you can control genetic expression by the use of nutrient therapy, then you can block the replication of this virus, or at least slow it down. If this virus successfully replicates at a high rate, it's going to, of course, cause an immune response. That's what we all know, and that's what we learn in school. But it's also going to affect the endoplasmic reticulum, which you can see here, 
and it's also going to affect the mitochondria, as you can see in this illustration as well. Here again, you have some opportunities to support and protect the function of mitochondria, the endoplasmic reticulum, and the immune system as a way, as a, as a strategy to alleviate the severity and duration of viral infection. So this is what I would call part four of my protocol, or actually part three right here and part four, supporting immune nutrition and supporting uh, nutritional protocols for endoplasmic reticulum and mitochondria. So, you know, we've only been at this for 15 minutes, but even now we're already starting to see some new ways that we can approach these viral infections, certainly beyond what I learned in medical school. Uh, and I have, a, I have a lot of respect for my medical school. It's very very tough, it's one of the best medical schools in the US. Uh, but we still, we only learned things within a medical model. We didn't, we didn't go beyond that model. So our task right now is to go beyond that model. Uh, one thing that, that you may have learned in school, uh, I only learned this in naturopathic school, uh, was the concept of antigenic drift. So, and, and this is uh, information from the U.S. government, the U.S. Uh, uh, Institute of Health, I believe. So I just want to show you this concept of uh, antigenic drift, and then we'll, we'll talk about how to uh, address that from a nutritional standpoint. So this is very well accepted in microbiology, that viruses mutate over time, and when they mutate and they change their protein structure, they're able to evade the immune system. Does that make sense? Right? So if the virus is able to change its identity, so to speak, or change its molecular fingerprint, then it has a better chance of escaping the immune system. And that's called, in this context, uh, antigenic drift. Well, here's, this is a very important concept because, again, if you look at public health and if you look at microbiology data, they all talk about how antigenic drift is very important. It's just something that happens naturally and it leads to the uh, greater severity and persistence of these infections. Well, here's a new slide that I, that I just made this morning, but you'll have all this information. We'll talk about it more later. One of the things you wanna understand about antigenic drift, which ultimately leads to what I call immune escape, is that it's directly influenced by free radicals and uh, antioxidant status within the host. So that's obviously something you can control with nutritional therapy. So the point being that if you give your patients antioxidants, you reduce their free radical burden. And if you reduce their free radical burden, you reduce the speed at which viruses undergo mutations. And if you reduce viral mutations, then you reduce antigenic drift and the immune system is able to uh, do a more efficient job of combating this viral infection. How's that sound? Sound reasonable? Well, I'll show you the data on it. The data is very strong. Uh, and it's very strong in animal studies and in human studies. So as I mentioned before, uh, viruses have what we call tropism or affinity for certain tissues. Uh, and the reasons I've given right here, it's either due to cellular receptors or proteins, a uh, different dependency on, on enzymes and transcription factors. That's just basic pathology. I won't spend a lot of time on that now. So let's just look at a few components of viral disease. Uh, direct infection and triggering of tissue destruction. You see that, for example, in viral hepatitis and herpes encephalitis. Uh, immunosuppression. Nearly all viral infections cause some level of immune suppression. So People, we might say, are more susceptible to viral infections if they're immune suppressed, but the viral infection itself causes immune suppression as well. Uh, many viral infections also cause mucosal damage, and that can lead to secondary bacterial infections. The classic example of that is upper respiratory infections. A lot of times people will have a viral infection, it causes immune suppression, and it causes damage to the uh, mucosal tissues. And then even after the viral infection gets cleared, patients then come in with a secondary viral or bacterial infection in the throat. 
Viruses also cause sustained cellular dysfunction. We see that with Alzheimer's disease and herpes, which we'll talk about more in a few moments. Another phenomenon is what's called cytokine storm or shock or, and hemorrhage, of course. Uh, we see that with Ebola and dengue hemorrhagic fever. And there are several components to this phenomenon, but one of them, for example, is that both Ebola and dengue lead to bone marrow suppression and then the bone marrow is not producing a sufficient number of platelets, and then that contributes. That's one of the components of the hemorrh hemorrhagic phenomenon. And my favorite topic is autoimmunity, and we see viral infections involved with uh, lupus, Sjogren's syndrome, and scleroderma very strongly uh, in those conditions. So here's another way of looking at viral infections, and this is kind of looking at news headlines mostly. I look at virus infections as either as being common, we'll talk about those, those are the, the common infections that we're all aware of, lethal, more serious. Uh, some interesting viral infections that have uh, become published lately, and then some viral infections that I think are on the horizon. I'll talk about that. I think that's pretty self-explanatory, so I'll try to save a few moments of time. Uh, this slide simply lists the viral infections that you all see in your clinical practices and that we've been taught to diagnose in medical school. Rhinoviruses, that's just common cold, rotavirus, gastrointestinal infection, influenza, measles, which has now experienced a resurgence in the United States, uh, mumps, and rubella. Those are just the common syndromic viruses. Uh, cytomegalovirus is also very common, about 60% of the U.S. population and very tightly associated with scleroderma. So, as I said at the start, what I want to help you do is not only appreciate different ways to treat these viral infections, but also appreciate different ways to treat your patients who come in with these diseases that are not obviously associated with viral infection. So, you know, in this case, another way of saying that is, in medical school, I never learned that viruses contributed to scleroderma. But lately, the, the data has become very clear on that. You can see this article uh, cited in your notes from 2013. So this is relatively new research. Uh, I graduated from medical school in 2010, so they wouldn't have had a chance to teach us this. Uh, and I don't know that they would have otherwise. But scleroderma is associated with several viral infections, one of which is cytomegalovirus. So the point is, obviously, if you have a patient with scleroderma, you might consider, and I would encourage you to, to actually treat the viral component of that disease. I think the date on that's quite strong. Uh, Ebola, of course, has been in the news. Everyone's aware of it. Most people are scared of it. Uh, it has about a 50 to 70 percent mortality rate, and this is just basic information you can get anywhere. Uh, I think Ebola is an interesting case. We'll talk about some of the political implications of Ebola later. Uh, but Ebola, according to this article, which, again, this is a new article I just put in the notes this morning when I was uh, making my final updates. Ebola is a selenium-dependent virus, meaning that it requires a lot of selenium uh, for its own replication. Uh, the consequence, according to the hypothesis presented in this article, is that it causes basically uh, acute selenium deficiency in the host because as the virus replicates, it's basically sucking selenium out of the human tissues for its own replication. Uh, or you might think of it as a virus chelator of, uh, of selenium. So the possibility, as presented in this article, is that it causes an acute selenium uh, deficiency, and that leads to some of the coagulation defects uh, and also promotes uh, viral replication because viruses replicate more readily in a selenium deficient environment. And here's where we get to talk about politics just a little bit. And I think this is appropriate <laughs> and worthwhile because again, as I said before, everything that we think about exists within a social and political context. Everything from the food that you eat to the clothes that you wear to your choice in politics and religion and lifestyle and all that, it's all social and political, <laughs> at least influenced uh, in part. So what we noticed in November, and this was just two months ago, 
what we noticed in November of uh, 2014 was a huge uh, media blitz, basically, uh, on Ebola. At least we saw this in the US. Again, I don't know if it happened here in Europe. But everyone's just scared to death of Ebola, right? Well, interestingly enough, a lot of that happened right at the same time we were having general elections in the United States. So you can see this huge spike of news on Ebola. It happened in the exact week of the general elections in the US. And then after that, just disappeared. Well, the, the virus didn't follow the same course, right? The virus didn't all of a sudden replicate all over the world only, only in the week of the general elections and then disappear, right? So this is, noted, another way of saying that is, look at the difference between media coverage and the reality of the condition, right? The disease didn't just appear and then disappear, but in the, in the minds of the people, it appeared and disappeared. So Time Magazine, I, I, I think you have it here in, in Europe, we have it in the US, it's kind of a popular magazine, but it's given some credibility. Look at what they called it. So this was just published last month. Uh, December 15th, they're calling, now they're calling Ebola the lie of the year in the United States, right? So this is only two months after the event. Lie of the year. It's not that Ebola isn't a threat or it's not that it doesn't exist, of course. It's just that it was over, overemphasized and exaggerated to the point of causing political chaos. Uh, and many people would argue, and I think they would argue reasonably, that this did change the outcome of the elections in the United States. Because when people are, I mean, you can see this, uh, people are afraid. What are they going to do when they are afraid? They're going to vote for defense. They're going to vote for border security. They're going to vote for more military, right? They're not going to vote for public education. They're not going to vote for mass transit, which we don't even have in the United States. So. Uh, that was discussed. I gave you a few more news sources for that information, which we won't spend a lot of time on. Uh, you can take a look at that. Uh, one of the things that was noticed is that the U.S. military was sent to Africa in order to combat uh, the Ebola uh, epidemic. That's a strange response to a viral infection to send in the military. Uh, and this was actually commented on in The Lancet. So independent from my own opinions, uh, I thought the Lancet very wisely stated, the goals of military deployment, deployment are in support of military strategy rather than humanitarian action. So that, this article from the Lancet is available for free. You can access that from the Lancet's website. So again, uh, when people are scared by misrepresented news, they're more likely to vote for uh, military power and border security and things like that rather than public services. So I think it did change the tone of, of the uh, political outcome in the US. Uh, again, now we're going back to the topic of endogenous retroviruses, something that I mentioned before, and I'll mention it again now just because I think it's probably a new topic for most people. So the way that this is described is to say that Throughout millions of years of human existence, and even pre-human existence, we acquired and encoded or embedded viruses within our human DNA. And so you could, I think a, a very reasonable way to describe that is to say that these are viral fragments or viral genetic fragments that are embedded within your DNA. You're born with these. All humans are born with these. These are called endogenous retroviruses. The reality of that is that when people are stressed out or when they're sick with another virus infection, these endogenous virus, or if they're nutritionally deficient, these endogenous viruses, let me say that slightly differently, these endogenous virus codes begin to replicate. So you could say that these are built-in viruses that are ready to at least partially replicate anytime you get sick, stressed out, or nutrient deficient. I think it's a beautiful model for a lot of things that we've looked at in clinical practice. The strongest association between endogenous retroviruses and disease is lupus, systemic lupus erythematosus, or SLE. I think the data on this is impressively strong. And that's why 
uh, in my most recent version of my rheumatology book, I emphasize treating viral infections as a component of the protocol for many of these autoimmune conditions. Uh, likewise, with Epstein-Barr virus, this is also associated with lupus and several autoimmune conditions. Epstein-Barr virus is an exogenous virus. It's not an endogenous virus. However, given that just about everybody has this virus, it's kind of sitting there waiting to get reactivated anytime you're stressed out, uh, immune suppressed, nutrient deficient, etc. And again, I think the data on this with autoimmune conditions is very, very strong, especially now for Sjogren's syndrome. But as I mentioned before, when we're looking at autoimmune conditions, we have to look at what I've called the total microbial load, which includes bacteria, of course, but it also includes viruses. And then we have to subcategorize the total microbial load to include the total viral load, which is our emphasis today. Hepatitis B and C, everybody knows about these. Uh, these do contribute to some rheumatic uh, conditions as well. Uh, another thing I'm gonna talk about, and I could talk about it with, with any of these pictures, but I might as well look at this one for a moment. Anytime somebody has an active viral infection, they're also activating their other viral infections that you may or may not be aware of. And I don't think I have that in the notes, but that, that process is called transactivation. And it, it goes back to the common theme that I mentioned before, and that is viruses replicate themselves through, a common, through common machinery, we might say. So anytime one virus is actively replicating, it's going to stimulate the replication of other viruses as well. Uh, this is a picture, obviously, of Oral herpes, very common. 50% of the worldwide population has this. And what's the disease association with herpes type one other than obviously uh, mucosal herpes that you're looking at here? The strongest association right now is uh, Alzheimer's disease. So if you see a patient who has herpes and let's say they're concerned about or they have a family risk of Alzheimer's, I think that's a patient you you'd want to take under your wing, so to speak, and uh, treat with an antiviral protocol. The data on that's, in my opinion, quite strong. Herpes simplex type one and type two are very common. Type one is 50% of the, US, of the uh, worldwide population adults, and about 20% of worldwide adults have herpes type two, whether they know it or not. A lot of people don't have uh, classic outbreaks, a lot of people just have <laughs> Uh, tissue irritation, and so they don't even know they have the infection. Uh, I think testing for IgG antibodies is very reliable. I think that's very reasonable. I, I use that test in my patients. The gold standard for the diagnosis of uh, herpes infections in uh, epidemiologic studies is called the Western blot. Uh, that's performed in the United States at the University of Washington in Seattle, Washington. Uh, but this IgG testing is about 98% uh, reliable compared to Western blot, so I, I think that's good enough. Obviously, we're all familiar with HIV. We'll talk about that more later today. I've given a little bit of information here about human herpes virus type 6, mostly associated with multiple sclerosis and chronic fatigue syndrome. Uh, HPV has gotten a lot of press lately. I'm sure you're all aware of that, right? Uh, I'm sure you're all being encouraged, or maybe you're not, but in the United States, we're all being encouraged to use the human papillomavirus vaccine for uh, everyone who's a female and then, and then some males as well, right? I have an opinion on that, which we'll talk about in a few moments. I think that this is a good example of uh, a high degree of selectivity uh, in appreciating uh, the relative importance of human papillomavirus. I think human papillomavirus uh, is certainly a player in cervical cancer, but I think other things are more important. Uh, and I, in my opinion, uh, pushing this vaccine on people is 
inappropriate. Uh, but it's very well funded, as if that makes a difference. Uh, parvovirus B19, we also see this associated with certain autoimmune conditions, especially scleroderma again. So you'll see that I mentioned earlier, scleroderma is associated with cytomegalovirus, Epstein-Barr virus, and parvovirus B19. So what you, part of what you're looking at in these autoimmune conditions, especially in this case, scleroderma, is multiple viral infections causing a cellular inflammatory response that leads to tissue fibrosis, which we then see as scleroderma clinically. In my opinion, the data on that is supremely strong. And I, I think it's time to take action on that. The data is relatively new as well. This was 2013, you can see here. Here's another article from 2000, uh, 2010, actually published in the Netherlands. So we haven't had time to see good clinical trials on this concept, but hopefully we will see that in the near future. Uh, Varicella zoster virus is the virus that causes chickenpox, also causes shingles or herpes zoster, associated with uh, temporal arteritis, which is an inflammatory uh, quasi-autoimmune condition. Uh, I talked earlier about bacteriophages. Those are viruses that infect bacteria. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on that right now. I've given you the citation here linking it to Crohn's disease. So I think most of those were the common viruses that we usually consider. Uh, this slide gives you some information about an, a relatively new virus that's been discovered called the algal virus. Uh, this is a virus that's been known for a long time to infect algae, but it's recently been shown to infect humans as well. I think about 20% of the uh, US population has this. I would presume it's in other populations as well, but the data I've seen is only in Americans. Actually, it's 43%, but there was a 20% uh, reduction in performance. That's, that's where the 20% came from. So interestingly enough, this virus doesn't cause any acute infection. It just makes people slower, mentally. So maybe it is unique to America. I don't know. Uh, and I can say that, so happily. Uh, here's more information on the same thing. American researchers discover what they're calling a stupidity virus. It's probably an epidemic in some portions of the world. So that was a relatively new infection. We didn't know about that before. These were the other viruses that hit the news. Obviously, Ebola was all over the place. Uh, now let's look at another new virus, which was also discovered just last year or so. Uh, this was published in December of 20. Of 2014, so this is less than a month old, very recent, and the new virus that we're discussing here is called the Bourbon virus. Uh, this caused a fatal condition in this elderly man within about 10 days, fever, lung and kidney failure, uh, muscle aches, loss of appetite, and so again this is another new virus uh, called the Bourbon virus. So what do you do with this information? If you're medically trained, and your only training is medicine, then you could do nothing against this virus other than wait for a drug or wait for a vaccination. Uh, the vaccination will never happen because the virus is too rare. No company is going to invest in that. And likewise uh, with the drug. So really from a conventional medical standpoint, I think we'd be pretty lost in our treatment of this virus unless we had a generalized antiviral strategy, which is what I'm presenting to you today. Here's another new virus. This is called the Heartland virus. This was published in New England Journal in 2012. This was the first report of it, uh, again, called the Heartland virus. So again, if you look at 2014 especially, uh, what you're looking at is more viral infections worldwide and more aggressive viral infections worldwide. And that's obviously the reason that we put this conference together. Because we, if, we, if we can understand this pathway and how to intervene in each step of this pathway, I think we'll have much greater uh, success in the treatment of viral infections and also just more therapeutic freedom. Right now, I think most medical doctors are trapped in, they only have three tools, sanitation, vaccination, and medication. 
and then supportive care for acutely ill patients. That's it. That's all we have in, in the hospital uh, treatment world. But from an integrative standpoint, if we look at the data, we've got we have many more many more options. So that's obviously the point uh, in today's presentation. Another thing that I mentioned uh, earlier was one category of viral infections. We could say is what we might call impending or pending viral infections, viruses that are kind of on the horizon, so to speak. So what does that mean? These are, well, this category of uh, discussion, so to speak, uh, involves the political use of viral infections, not simply to sway uh, votes as we looked at before, which I think is certainly quite possible, but in the use of viral infections for bioterrorism, as it's called, uh, which is probably going to happen, I would predict, reasonably. It's probably going to happen at some point. Uh, and interestingly enough, if you look at the press from the United States, even at the highest levels of government, they have a consistent pattern of mismanaging research and actually mismanaging the uh, samples of these pathogenic viruses in such a way that I, I think it's actually suspect by itself. Uh, if you look at this article, which was just published in July of last year, I think it was maybe a little more recent than that, but this article is dated July. You'll see here that uh, the FDA, the Food and Drug Administration in the United States, just happened to find 300 vials of pathogenic viruses, including smallpox. In, in, in like a storage closet in, in one of their offices. Well, you know, anyone presumably could have found that and misused it because they had no accounting for those. And, you know, when I look, and this is only one example, but there are many examples recently of mismanagement of viral research or viral samples. And a, a reasonable hypothesis is to say that it's just a matter of time until that falls into the wrong hands for the wrong reason. So that's just my opinion based on the data. Uh, how many of you have seen the movie called V for Vendetta? A few of you? Not, not a lot of you? My opinion is it's a very important movie. So this came out in the US in 2006. Uh, again, the, the name of the movie is V for Vendetta. I encourage all of you to see this. I'm sure you can get various translations of it. Part of what's discussed in this movie is the use of, the governmental use of an accidental viral release in order to uh, manipulate politics and the public and all this on an international level. Uh, and I, I encourage you to take a look at that movie. It's very excellent. Uh, and the story, I think, is, is seeing some representation in real life. I actually have a video clip of that movie embedded right now, which uh, we can take a look at, but I think with the uh, differences and the, the challenges with translation, I'll just bypass that. It's available on the internet for free, so. You have information for us. No, you already have the information. All the names and dates are inside your head. What you want, what you really need, is a story. A story can be true or false. I leave such judgments to you, Inspector. Our story begins, as these stories often do, with a young up-and-coming politician. He's a deeply religious man and a member of the Conservative Party. He's completely single-minded and has no regard for the political process. The more power he attains, the more obvious his zealotry, and the more aggressive his supporters become. Eventually, his party launches a special project in the name of national security. At first, it's believed to be a search for biological weapons, and it's pursued without regard to its cost. However, the true goal of this project is power, complete and total hegemonic domination. The project, however, ends violently. But the efforts of those involved are not in vain, for a new ability to wage war is born from the blood of one of the victims. Imagine a virus, the most terrifying virus you can, and then imagine that you and you alone have the cure. But if your ultimate goal is power, how best to use such a weapon? It's at this point in our story that along comes a spider. 
He is a man seemingly without a conscience, for whom the ends always justify the means, and it is he who suggests that their target should not be an enemy of the country, but rather the country itself. Three targets are chosen to maximize the effect of the attack, a school, a tube station, and a water treatment plant. Several hundred die within the first few weeks. That Three Waters has, in fact, been contaminated. Authorities are attempting to control its deadly spread. Sent a wave of destruction throughout the underground. Fueled by the media, fear and panic spread quickly, fracturing and dividing the country until at last the true goal comes into view. Before the St. Mary's crisis, no one would have predicted the results of the election that year, no one. And then not long after the election, lo and behold, a miracle. Some believed it was the work of God himself, but it was a pharmaceutical company controlled by certain party members that made them all obscenely rich. A year later, several extremists are tried, found guilty, and executed while a memorial is built to canonize their victims. But the end result, the true genius of the plan, was the fear. Fear became the ultimate tool of this government, and through it, our politician was ultimately appointed to the newly created position of High Chancellor. The rest, as they say, is history. Now let's talk briefly about uh, vaccinations and antiviral drugs. I don't have a huge uh, soapbox that I need to stand on for too long on this topic, uh, but I do think that vaccinations are overemphasized, and that doesn't mean I'm anti-vaccination. It just means what I'm in favor of is the appropriate use of vaccination. And certainly what we see in the US, uh, and certainly in medical school, is that we're supposed to give vaccinations all the time. We're not supposed to question them. Supposed to give them to infants, we're supposed to give them to little girls, whether they have exposure or not. And I just think it's it's almost like vaccination is kind of a religion. It's like you you have to do it and you can't question it. Um, at least the way that it's uh, administered politically and academically. Uh, one, I'll tell you like one of my own stories, and I don't I don't think I've told this story too many times before. But when I was in medical school, I was told I had to get vaccinated for hepatitis B. And uh, I said, well, I don't, have, I don't have any risk of exposure necessarily to hepatitis B, uh, and I don't want the vaccine, so no thanks. Well, you can, as you might imagine, that didn't go over very well. So that was the first week of medical school, the first Monday of medical school. I was called into the office of the vice president, and he said to me, and I, I, I wrote this in the notes, so you, you have this conversation. He said to me, if you don't get vaccinated, we consider you a threat to the public health, and we consider you non-compliant with school policy, which was another way of saying that they're gonna kick me out of school. So, you know, obviously at that point I had to make a, make a, make a decision, and obviously I decided to get vaccinated, but only because I was basically forced to do it. And we could argue that, well, Medical doctors have exposure to blood, and therefore uh, vaccination with hepatitis B would be reasonable. But then I was also forced to get uh, a flu vaccine when I was working in the hospitals. This was after medical school when I was doing my family medicine residency. And they sent out an announcement on Thursday saying, you have to get the flu vaccine, or you have to wear a mask 14 hours a day when you're working. And I said to them, that is not, neither one of those are viable options for me. So that was Thursday, and I resigned the next day from the hospital. <laughs> and I think I've included some of that conversation here. So, you know, we all have to make decisions. That was just the decision I made. Uh, you see a lot of politics uh, around vaccinations. I've given you some examples here. This was an article from last year talking about an outbreak of pertussis. Uh, and you know, the, the media wants to create the picture and the, the government and the public health agencies want to create a picture that outbreaks are dependent on people not getting vaccinated. Because we all know, of course, and this is satire, we all, we're all taught that vaccinations are the salvation of humanity from viral infections, right? And so therefore, any viral epidemic is a direct consequence of people not getting vaccinated. That's what we're taught. But that's not actually, of course, the case. 
Uh, in this case, they wanted to say that this viral outbreak, this epidemic, was caused by people not getting vaccinated. But actually, only 10% of the population hadn't been vaccinated, which means that 90% had been. So, you know, another way that they could have framed this is that in 90% of the kids who got vaccinated, they still got sick. But no one wants to admit that part of the story. So here's another uh, important part. And I'm glad that I included the text here because I actually have a video on this, which we're not going to look at, uh, again, due to translation complications. But if you look at who advocates for vaccines, you'll also notice that, generally speaking, they're very well paid for their advocacy. If you look at the American Academy of Pediatrics, they receive massive amounts of money from drug companies in order to promote those policies. Another organization in the U.S. is called Every Child by Two. They also receive a lot of money from drug companies. And one of the uh, advocates for vaccinations in the U.S. also receives presumably millions of dollars for his advocation of uh, vaccines. You can see this in a, in a news clip that's on the Internet for free. I included that here, but we won't go... We won't go into it right now, just for time. Uh, here's uh, the governor of Texas, Rick Perry. He was actually paid at least $5,000 at one point. Maybe he was paid more later. Uh, but he was directly paid by the drug companies in order to sign this legislation to mandate the HPV vaccine for, for young girls. So again, when I was doing my hospital training, we were specifically instructed to give all these young girls this HPV vaccine. And for those of us who were aware of the politics and who were aware of the research and who resisted that policy, you know, that's, it had consequences. Uh, so here's the video. Uh, again, you have this uh, news link, or sorry, the internet link on your, in your notes. You can take a look at that. It's only about five minutes worth of video, but it's very powerful. Years now, parents have wondered if vaccines are linked to conditions like autism and ADD. Government officials and some scientists say there is no connection, and they're often backed by independent experts. But just how independent are they? You may be surprised at what Cheryl Ackeson found when she set out to follow the money. They're some of the most trusted voices in the defense of vaccine safety. The American Academy of Pediatrics, Every Child by Two, and pediatrician Dr. Paul Offit. But CBS News has found these three have something more in common. Polio number two. Strong financial ties to the industry whose products they promote and defend. The vaccine industry gives millions to the Academy of Pediatrics for conferences, grants, medical education classes, even help pay to build their headquarters. The totals are kept secret, but public documents reveal bits and pieces. $342,000 was given to the Academy by Wyeth, maker of the pneumococcal vaccine, for a community grant program. $433,000 was contributed to the Academy by Merck, the same year the Academy endorsed Merck's HPV vaccine. Another top donor, Sanofi Aventis, maker of 17 vaccines, and a new 5-in-1 combo shot just added to the childhood vaccine schedule last month. Every Child by Two, a group that promotes early immunization for all children, admits the group takes money from the vaccine industry too, but wouldn't tell us how much. A spokesman told us there are simply no conflicts to be unearthed. But guess who has been listed as the group's treasurers? An official from Wyeth and a paid advisor to big pharmaceutical clients. Then there's Dr. Paul Offit, perhaps the most widely quoted defender of vaccine safety. He's gone so far as to say babies can theoretically tolerate, quote, 10,000 vaccines at once. This is how Offit described himself in a previous interview. I'm the chief of infectious diseases at Children's Hospital of Philadelphia and a professor of pediatrics at Penn's Medical School. Dr. Offit was not willing to be interviewed on this subject, but like others in our investigation, he has strong industry ties. In fact, he's a vaccine industry insider. Dr. Offit holds a $1.5 million research chair at Children's Hospital funded by Merck. He holds the patent on an anti-diarrhea vaccine he developed with Merck, Rotatec, which has prevented thousands of hospitalizations in the U.S. And future royalties for the vaccine were just sold for $182 million cash. Dr. Offit's share of vaccine profits, unknown. 
There's nothing illegal about the possible conflicts of interest, but as one member of Congress put it, money from the pharmaceutical industry can shape the practices of those who hold themselves out to be independent. The American Academy of Pediatrics, Every Child by Two, and Dr. Offit wouldn't agree to interviews, but all told us they're upfront about the money they receive, and it doesn't sway their opinions. Today's immunization schedule now calls for kids to get 55 doses of vaccines by age six. Ideally, it makes for a healthier society, but critics worry that industry ties could impact the advice given to the public about all those vaccines. Cheryl Atkinson, CBS News, Washington. Uh, here's the vaccination schedule in the U.S. Again, I think many of us would agree that this is absurd to give this many vaccinations to young children. One of the things that's come out recently is the correlation between infant mortality and vaccination rates. So if vaccines were as great as we're told they are, what we should see is a reduction in mortality associated with vaccination use. But in fact, according to this data, we actually see the opposite. So children who receive more vaccinations actually have higher infant mortality. And some people, including myself, are inclined to think that this accounts for the higher rate of infant mortality that we have in the US. So the United States spends more money on healthcare than any country in the world. And we have one of the highest incidences of infant mortality. This article, just published in October of 2014, uh, noted that, yes, we spend a lot, and yes, we have the highest infant mortality, but through certain measures, American babies are actually born very, very healthy by international standards. But you can see this article says, something happens within the first few months of life that, that changes an advantage to a disadvantage in the U.S. And I think that that is quite likely the absolute uh, overwhelming of the immune system with all these vaccinations. Uh, and here's the close-up of that data. Uh, here's another article showing that children who get flu vaccination have three times the risk of hospitalization for flu. This was published by the American Thoracic Society in 2009. It's also available online. Uh, here's a correlation between the flu vaccine and narcolepsy. And I'll just give you some examples. Uh, in this article, uh, and this was a very authoritative review. They showed that flu vaccines actually did not reduce overall mortality. Same thing here. Uh, what we're told as doctors in the US especially is to vaccinate, vaccinate, even when it doesn't work. Well, there are risks, of course, associated with uh, giving vaccinations. Here's another article, again, stating that vaccines uh, don't really uh, provide a lot of public health advantage, especially for elderly patients. And they do, of course, come with some risk. Here, here's an elderly male patient who developed uh, basically encephalitis, uh, central nervous system demyelinization, basically kind of an acute form of multiple sclerosis, you might say. Oh, and the other thing, here's another example, uh, encephalomyelitis following uh, flu vaccination. Adverse effects from vaccinations are, as you would expect, notoriously underreported. Uh, the most recent estimate that I've seen is that only 10% of adverse effects from vaccines are actually reported. So anytime you see a report, you're actually just looking at the tip of the iceberg. Dr. Suba is a, a clinician in the United States, he's a medical doctor. He's done a lot of, in my opinion, very excellent work on human papillomavirus. And you can see in this case, this was correspondence between Dr. Suba and the government. He asked them, he said, how much do you actually get paid for advocating the human papillomavirus vaccine? Uh, and they refused to answer him. Well, if there was nothing to disclose, then maybe a reasonable reply would have been, we don't, we don't take any money from drug companies, right? We don't. We're not going to take money from drug companies and then advocate their product. That would be unethical. I mean, that would be a reasonable response if that were the case. But as you can see here, their response was that we're not going to tell you. Uh, there, 
In this letter, you can see some conversation about uh, NIH revenues, royalties, percentage of sales, and then they said, we don't have to tell you what, what it is. So we don't know the answer, but uh, this, the conversation itself suggests that something's going on. Uh, here's another article, I think, by Dr. Suba, or at least it's a lot of his work, uh, about the misuse of clinical trials in India. Uh, the purpose of the trials appears to be showing that the HPV vaccine is effective. Uh, and so what they did is they failed to screen uh, these thousands of women for cervical cancer with uh, pap smear testing, which of course is the gold standard internationally. Uh, and apparently that was done to then show that the vaccine actually had some benefit. But in the process, uh, that led to uh, 250, 254 women dying of otherwise uh, preventable cervical cancer. Another HPV vaccine case, you've got that here. Uh, another fatal case here following vaccination. All of these are available online for free. So even though I'm going through them pretty quickly, I just found them just by doing a, a relatively random search. They're, they're pretty easy to find if you just search on your favorite search engine. Uh, of course, the whole goal of using HPV vaccination is to prevent cervical cancer, but I think that we might be able to do the same thing with nutrition. I'll show you that uh, in just a moment as well. So again, what we learn in medical school in the traditional, conventional way and both of those are misused terms. It's not traditional or conventional, but the way that it's discussed in the, in the modern uh, mainstream press is to focus on sanitation, vaccination, and drugs all the time. Uh, and I rarely see the conversation, in fact, I never see the conversation go beyond that. Sanitation, vaccination, and drugs. And so what I think we need to do in order to uh, not be swayed by viral panic and to be more effective clinicians is to actually understand this process better and see what we might do, uh, in this case, through the use of nutrition. Uh, one of the antiviral drugs that's very popular is Tamiflu. It barely works, you know? So governments are spending billions of dollars to stockpile this drug, and the drug barely works. Well, what would happen if we spent billions of dollars on public health care, better nutrition, what about free nutritional supplements or nutritional education programs? What would happen if we spent billions of dollars doing that? I think we'd, we'd be much farther ahead. So here are some problems with depending on antiviral drugs. Uh, I've listed those out. I won't go through them right now because we do need to keep making progress. Uh, here's an excellent review article. So again, I'm not completely against antiviral drugs. What I'm against is the exclusive reliance on those drugs. I think that's a mistake. But I also readily acknowledge that in some cases, especially acute illnesses, they, are, they have a place. Here's an excellent article on antiviral drugs, which you can get uh, for free on the internet. That's basically what we just covered, mostly for context. What we're going to focus on in the next conversation are the antiviral drug, or sorry, uh, the antiviral component of the protocol, which can include antiviral drugs, but we're going to focus on nutrients and botanicals. And then we'll get into the other components uh, after lunch, or after the break, I should say. So let me escape really quickly out of this presentation, and then we'll start on the second one. Sorry, my mouse is not on the screen. There it is. So while I'm uh, reorganizing the slides here, does anybody have a quick question that I might answer? I think we're good to go as of now. We can always do questions later. So let's get into the first part of the strategy, uh, which is the antiviral uh, component, and then we'll take a break. So let's talk about things you can do in your practice or with yourself right now. And certainly by the end of the day, I'd like you to be able to actually outline by, by memory I'm not trying to be too pedantic, uh, but I'd like for you to be able to outline a certain protocol that you might use in your, in your own practice. Uh, 